creatures and animals that God did not create, but sin did. The last one will surprise you. Number 1. Nephilim Before the flood, there was an abomination that took place. A creature was born that embodied the entire plan of evil forces. It was a mixture of two beings that were not meant to come together. Genesis chapter 6 verses 1 through 4 captivates many Bible readers because of the mysterious identity of both the sons of God and the Nephilim. There was a problem with ungodly intermarriage between the sons of God and the daughters of men during these days of rapid population expansion, primarily because of long lifespans in the pre-flood world. We can deduce why Satan sent his angels to intermarry with human women, directly or indirectly. Satan attempted to pollute mankind's genetic pool with satanic corruption, planting something resembling a genetic pathogen in order to render the human race unfit to bear the seed of the woman the Messiah, promised in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. The Savior could not be born of a demon-possessed mother. So if Satan could succeed in infecting the entire race, the Deliverer could not come. And Satan came close to succeeding. The people had become so polluted that God decided to relaunch with Noah and his sons and imprison the demons who had polluted it so they could never do it again. Now it happened, when men began to multiply in the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and desirable, and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose and desired. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive and remain with man forever, because he is indeed flesh, sinful, corrupt, given over to sensual appetites. Nevertheless, his days shall yet be a hundred and twenty years. There were Nephilim, men of stature, notorious men of the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God lived with the daughters of men, and they gave birth to their children. These were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown, great reputation, fame. The Lord saw that the wickedness, depravity of man was great on the earth, and that every imagination or intent of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. Genesis chapter 6 verses 1 through 7 God did not intend for the human race to remain in this rebellious state indefinitely. This means that our rejection of God has reached a point of no return. God will not woo us indefinitely. There will come a time when he will say, no more. Yet his days will be 120 years. This is interesting, as the flood also happened 120 years after this announcement. We then read, giants on the earth in those days. Both pre-Christian Judaism and the early church held that the sons of God were spirit beings or angels who took human wives and gave birth to giants known as the Nephilim. This view has become less prevalent today due to our modern dislike of the supernatural. While the everyday Christian may reluctantly embrace the Bible's teaching about Christ's virgin birth and resurrection, the idea of human and spirit-bred giants is just too far-fetched. But why were men all of a sudden so violent? Was it because the godly line mixed with the ungodly line? Or was it, at least in part, because humanity had mixed with spirit beings? I would like to argue for the latter. The three main perspectives on the identity of God's sons are as follows. First, they were fallen angels. Second, they were powerful human rulers. Or third, they were godly descendants of Seth intermarrying with wicked descendants of Cain. Arguments for the traditional view that the sons of God were spirit beings who mated with human women and produced the Nephilim are as follows. The fact that the phrase sons of God 
always refers to angels in the Old Testament lend support. Job chapter 1 verse 6 Now there was a day when the sons of God, angels, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan, adversary, accuser, also came among them. In all cases, the sons of God are speared angelic beings, including Satan. The phrases used in Job suggest that Genesis chapter 6 is referring to spirits, angels. Genesis chapter 6 verses 1 through 2 contrasts the sons of God with man, implying that these are non-human beings. Genesis chapter 6 verse 1 says, that man began to multiply and daughters were born to them. The Hebrew word for man is the generic term for mankind, as used in Genesis chapter 5 verses 1 through 2. The sons of God are contrasted with man. Thus, the sons of God were distinct from man and married all mankind's daughters. As a result, the sons of God must be non-human beings of some kind. Another theory of the fathers of the Nephilim. The context implies that the Nephilim were the resulting offspring of spirit beings and humans. The Nephilim, or fallen ones in Genesis chapter 6 verse 4, are mysterious personalities. The mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. The text does not explain how the Nephilim arrived. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of man and bore children to them. It simply states. But why are the Nephilim mentioned in Genesis chapter 6, alongside the intermarriage of the sons of God and daughters of man? It is unclear how these mighty men of renown came about if they were not the outcome of intermarriage between spirit beings and humans. There is a theory about the father of the Nephilim. Jude likely understands Genesis chapter 6 verses 1 through 4 to refer to the intermarriage between spirit beings and humans. Jude verse 6 tells of angels who did not stay within their position of authority, but left their proper dwelling. Unless Jude is referring to an unknown event, he appears to be referring to the angels who left heaven to live on earth in Genesis chapter 6 verses 1 through 4. These arguments support the traditional view that the sons of God mated with human women and gave birth to the Nephilim. Though this may appear strange to modern ears, the same could be said for the entire Bible. Truth is stranger than fiction, and the world God has created is far from what we commonly believe. The sons of God saw the daughters of men. It is more accurate to see the sons of God as either demons, angels in rebellion against God, or uniquely demon-possessed men, and the daughters of men as human women. Jude verse 6 And angels who did not keep their own designated place of power, but abandoned their proper dwelling place, these, he has kept in eternal chains under the thick gloom of utter darkness for the judgment of the great day. Jude verse 6 also explains what God did with these evil angels. 1 Peter chapter 3 verses 19 through 20 informs us Jesus proclaimed his victory on the cross over them. While God commanded all the earth to be cleansed of this pollution, he found one man with whom to begin again. Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. However, the next being was worse. Number 2. Lucifer becomes Satan. From glory to curse. A personality referred to as Lucifer in Isaiah chapter 14. Lucifer's Latin root means one who brings light while the Hebrew translation is Morning Star. Lucifer was depicted as a radiant, shining, and majestic being in any language. He was a high-ranking angel. Lucifer was one of God's main angels, and Michael and Gabriel in God's heavenly hosts. However, 
At some point, Lucifer made a grave error. He challenged God. Luke chapter 10, verse 18. He said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. During one of his teachings to his disciples, Jesus shared a vivid description of a scene he had personally experienced in heaven. This event took place before he was born as the son of Mary. He used this encounter to caution his followers about the dangers of allowing pride to control their actions and decisions. That scene he described was God's judgment on a created angel named Lucifer. Lucifer had occupied a position of unique honor in heaven. Son of man, take up a dirge, funeral poem to be sung, for the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You had the full measure of perfection and the finishing touch of completeness, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the ruby, the topaz and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx and the jasper, the lapis lazuli, the turquoise and the emerald, and the gold, the workmanship of your settings and your sockets was in you. They were prepared on the day that you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers and protects, and I placed you there. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire, sparkling jewels. You were blameless in your ways. From the day you were created, until unrighteousness and evil were found in you. Ezekiel chapter 28 verses 12 through 15. Lucifer is described as the anointed cherub who covers. The cherubim spread their wings atop, enveloping the mercy seat with their wings. They faced each other. The faces of the cherubim were towards the mercy seat. Lucifer was exemplary in beauty. Pride caused him to challenge God and to seek a place of equality with God. Apparently, Lucifer had authority over a company of angels, and he had succeeded in alienating some of those under him from their loyalty to God. He led them to join him in his rebellion against God. In response, God cast Lucifer and his partners in rebellion from his presence. In order to describe Lucifer's activity in turning some angels against God through his persistent plot, Ezekiel chapter 28 verses 16 through 19. Through the abundance of your commerce, you were internally filled with lawlessness and violence, and you sinned. Therefore I have cast you out as a profane and unholy thing from the mountain of God. And I have destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was proud and arrogant because of your beauty. You destroyed your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I lay you before kings, that they might look at you. You profaned your sanctuaries by the great quantity of your sins and the enormity of your guilt, by the unrighteousness of your trade. Therefore I have brought forth a fire from your midst. It has consumed you, and I have reduced you to ashes on the earth in the sight of all who look at you. All the peoples, nations who knew you, are appalled at you. You have come to a horrible and terrifying end, and will forever cease to be. In some Bible versions, we see the word trading, which is applied to someone who behaves as a tale-bearer or slanderer. In other words, it could be described as someone who peddles both goods and gossip. In various other Bibles, for example, Leviticus, Proverbs, Jeremiah, this word is translated as either a tale-bearer or slanderer. For example, in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 19, this practice of being a tale-bearer is closely linked to one who flatters himself with his lips. We are warned against both kinds of persons. 
He who goes about as a tale-bearer reveals secrets. Therefore do not associate with one who flatters with his lips. Apparently, this illustrates exactly what Lucifer did. He went among the created angelic beings and promoted an organized rebellion against God. I would give you a much more responsible position in the administration of the universe. The devil has never had to change his tactics, either in heaven or on earth, for one simple reason, because they still work. All this did not happen suddenly or even in a few days. We have no way of measuring the time it took Lucifer to promote his rebellion that it was long enough for him to organize a carefully planned revolt against God and to convince an estimated one-third of the angels to join him. This estimate is based on a statement about Satan in the Bible. Revelation chapter 12 verse 4 And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. It interprets the phrase stars of heaven as referring to the entire company of angels. The revolutionary acts that are produced originated in heaven and not on earth. As a master of slander or tale bearing, he continues to seek to undermine various forms of authority that God has established in both the church and in the world. When Lucifer was cast out of heaven, he did not stop his rebellion, but he continued it by setting up a kingdom of his own in opposition to God's kingdom. Pride, the original sin. We read, Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground, I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Lucifer's heart was lifted up in pride because of his beauty, and this was the reason that he was cast out of the mountain of God. What was Lucifer's initial motivation? What was the original sin? Pride. The original sin was done in heaven, not on earth. It wasn't alcohol intoxication. It wasn't adultery. And it wasn't even lying. It was a matter of pride. It is still the most lethal of all sins. Many church goers would never dream of committing adultery or getting drunk, but they are readily seduced into pride without recognizing how harmful it is. Lucifer was so lovely that he got proud of himself. His pride finalized the transformation from Lucifer to Satan. I believe it is vital for all of us to realize that the first sin in the universe was not murder, nor adultery, but rather pride. It was pride that produced rebellion. Furthermore, it was pride arising from the blessings of which God himself was the author. God gave Lucifer his power, authority, beauty, and wisdom. All those were gifts from God. Yet Lucifer's wrong attitude turned them into instruments for his own destruction. I am shocked to realize that men and women called and equipped by God are still today making the same tragic error that Lucifer made. In Isaiah chapter 14 verses 12 through 15, the prophet analyzes the motive behind Lucifer's rebellion. It was an ambition to be equal with God. Lucifer made five succeeding statements preceded by the phrase, I will. He said, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne. I will sit on the mount of the congregation. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. Lastly comes the climax. I will be like or equal to the Most High, like God himself. Lucifer's self-promoting ambition was the cause of his failure. Scripture confronts us with a deliberate contrast between Lucifer and Jesus. Lucifer was not in the form of God. He was a created being. 
He had no right to be equal with God, yet he grasped at equality with God, and when he reached up, he slipped and fell. On the other hand, Jesus was divine by eternal nature and enjoyed equality with God. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. God has highly exalted him. God has given him a name that is above every name. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Of those in heaven, that is, all the created hosts who serve God in his heaven, of those on earth, this means that ultimately, every creature on earth will submit to the authority of Christ. Of those under the earth, this refers to Satan's realm in Hades. It includes death, hell, the grave, and also the unrighteous dead who had previously rejected God's mercy. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. There is only one pathway to promotion, self-humbling. This is an absolutely unvarying principle. There are no exceptions. The way up is down. That is the great secret. As Proverbs chapter 18 verse 12 declares, Before destruction the heart of man is haughty, and before honor is humility. Referring again to Philippians, we see a wonderful truth brought to light. For this reason also God highly exalted him, and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. Self-humbling is an issue of the will, not of the emotions. It is a decision each of us has to make for himself. Lord, I choose to humble myself before you. I renounce pride, arrogance, and personal ambition before you and before my fellow believers. Your pomp and magnificence have been brought down to Sheol, along with the music of your harps. The maggots, which prey on the dead, are spread out under you, as a bed, and worms are your covering, Babylonian rulers. How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, light bringer, son of the dawn! You have been cut down to the ground, you who have weakened the nations, king of Babylon. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven, I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the remote parts of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. But in fact, you will be brought down to Sheol, to the remote recesses of the pit, the region of the dead. Isaiah chapter 14 verses 11 through 15. Lucifer's desire was to be on same footing with God. He imagined himself to be so intelligent, beautiful, and majestic that he allegedly thought to himself, I could be God. According to scripture, Lucifer undermined the loyalty of one third of God's angels and lured them into his rebellion and fall. Biblical scholars generally agree that Lucifer was in charge of orchestrating heaven's worship. He was a musical master who continues to utilize music to enchant people to this day. Lucifer had been in charge of God's sanctuary in heaven. He was in charge of the religious services. He was the cherub who guarded the location where God's presence showed itself. He was in charge of the music. He was an artist. He had a lot of success. He then rebelled and fell. Pride. The battle lines are drawn. He was sent down from God's presence after becoming prideful of his wisdom and beauty, and after devising his plotted rebellion against God. His treacherous angels were also cast down with him. Lucifer, 
was perhaps the wisest and most beautiful of all God's creatures. But scripture says his heart was lifted up. The fall of Lucifer, Satan, started from within before it led to his fall. After growing proud because of his wisdom and his beauty, and after hatching his planned rebellion against God, he was cast down from the presence of God, and his traitorous angels were cast down with him. We should take this into account in our own lives. God created Adam as unique from any other creature. There was something special about Adam's mode of creation that was designed in the mind of the Creator to militate against pride. Adam came from a source different from any other created being that we know of, the very lowest, the very humblest. Yet God made him capable of becoming the very highest. God combined in Adam, both the lowest and highest. Here's the description of the creation of Adam in Genesis. And the Lord God formed man, or Adam, of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being, or soul. Unlike Lucifer, we can remember this and stay grounded and humble. Satan's Counterattack Satan, the already fallen angel, the enemy of God and of man retaliated. He had particular enmity against man for two reasons. First of all, he could attack God's image in man. You see, man visibly represented God to the rest of creation. Satan could not touch God himself, but he could make war against the very image of God within man. His delight was to defile that image to destroy it, to humiliate it, and to that end, he worked tirelessly. When someone stops worshipping, they begin to seek worship. Heaven is too small for two objects of worship. And it is written in Jude verse 1, that the angels who did not keep their first estate, number one, were cast down. The Lesson of Lucifer's Fall First, when you refuse to worship, you get down, you go down. If you want to be a down Christian, be too proud to worship. Second, pride is a fast way down. The devil was once the bright morning star, a lovely angelic being who fell from the heavens. He rebelled against God becoming Satan, God's ultimate foe. What you don't turn into praise becomes pride. And we were never created. The higher we rise, the more we're supposed to give God the glory. The glory to God, the honor to God, and the more God blesses you, you're not supposed to become more arrogant. Look at me, I don't have to worship like those lowly people. You were nothing at the time, but God picked you up and blessed you. According to the Bible, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. In the book of Genesis, God breathed on mankind. Be a worshiper. If you have the life of God in you, then praise the Lord. That is the commandment of the scriptures. We were justified to glorify. We were liberated to love him. You've been redeemed to rejoice. You've been delivered to dance. You've been set free to sing. Be humble and praise God. Praise is a serious topic in the Bible. However, there are those who make light of it and make fun of it, even in the church. The only thing that can keep you in a spiritual environment, and I emphasize this, is to praise and worship God. The day you decide not to worship God, you leave His presence. A fish cannot survive without water. The human body cannot survive without oxygen. And a Christian cannot survive without praising and worshiping God. You'll have to thank God sooner or later. You'll have to learn to clap your hands and say hallelujah sooner or later. Praise be to God. 
thank you a lot, Jesus. I adore you, Lord. Praise be to God. In any case, sooner or later, if you do not, you will not be in God's presence, and you will perish if you do not spend time in God's presence. Number 3. The Final Form of the Serpent Imagine a place more beautiful than any park or garden you have ever seen. Keep in mind that the Garden of Eden was more than just an ordinary park or garden that you can ever imagine. The Garden of Eden was a perfect paradise created by God. It had every kind of tree that was good for food and pleasing to the eye. God placed Adam and Eve in this garden, providing them with everything they needed to be happy and healthy. Adam had an important job in the Garden of Eden. God saw that it was not good for Adam to be alone. He decided to create a companion for him. Adam and Eve lived in perfect harmony with God and nature. God gave Adam and Eve one rule to follow. They must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This was a special tree, placed in the middle of the garden, and eating from it would bring about terrible consequences. God wanted to protect them from these consequences, so he clearly instructed them not to eat its fruit. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may freely, unconditionally eat the fruit from every tree of the garden, but only from the tree of the knowledge, recognition of good and evil, you shall not eat. Otherwise, on the day that you eat from it, you shall most certainly die, because of your disobedience. Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 through 17. In the Garden of Eden, there was a really smart snake. This snake was different from the rest. It could speak and had a sneaky idea to trick Adam and Eve. Now the serpent was more crafty, subtle, skilled in deceit than any living creature of the field which the Lord God had made. And the serpent, Satan, said to the woman, Can it really be that God has said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 The Bible tells us that the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. The serpent began to speak to Eve, asking her a tricky question to make her doubt God's command. It asked if God really said they couldn't eat from any tree in the garden. The serpent was trying to confuse Eve and make her think that God's rules were unreasonable. Eve replied to the serpent, explaining that they could eat from the trees in the garden except for the one in the middle. She also added that they must not even touch it or they would die. The serpent then told Eve a bold lie, directly contradicting what God had said. It claimed that they would not die if they ate the fruit. Instead, it said that their eyes would be opened and they would be like God, knowing good and evil. Genesis chapter 3 verses 4 through 5 This lie made Eve doubt God's goodness and his warning. Eve began to look at the fruit of the forbidden tree differently. She saw that it was good for food, pleasing to the eye, and desirable for gaining wisdom. The serpent's words made her think that eating the fruit might be a good idea after all. This shows how Eve was tempted in three ways, through her physical appetite, her visual attraction, and her desire for wisdom. These are common ways that people are tempted even today. Have you ever been tempted to do something because it looked good or seemed like a smart thing to do? even if you knew it was wrong. Eve made the fateful decision to eat the fruit. She took some and ate it, and then she gave some to Adam who was with her, and he ate it too. This act of disobedience was the first sin, and it changed everything for Adam and Eve and for all humanity. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, 
and that it was delightful to look at, and a tree to be desired in order to make one wise and insightful. She took some of its fruit and ate it, and she also gave some to her husband with her, and he ate. Genesis chapter 3 verse 6 After they ate the fruit, their eyes were open, and they realized they were naked. They felt shame and guilt for the first time, and tried to cover themselves with fig leaves. This was a big change from their innocence before the fall. This story shows how the serpent, who is Satan in disguise, uses deceit and lies to lead people away from God. It reminds us to be careful about whom we listen to and to trust in God's word. Have you ever felt tricked by something that seemed good at first but turned out to be bad? Adam and Eve's disobedience didn't just bring physical consequences, it also brought spiritual consequences. They were separated from God in a way they had never been before. This separation is called spiritual death. They no longer had the close, perfect relationship with God that they once enjoyed. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God, that is, his remarkable, overwhelming gift of grace to believers, is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans chapter 6 verse 23 The Serpent's Punishment After Adam and Eve owned up to not following God's orders, God started to announce consequences, beginning with the snake. The serpent, used by Satan to deceive Eve, was cursed above all other animals. It would crawl on its belly and eat dust all its life. This curse marked the serpent as a representation of deceit and evil. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the cattle, and more than any animal of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. Genesis chapter 3 verse 14 This curse showed that there's always a fight between good and evil. God said there would be a strong dislike between the snake and the woman, and also between their children. This prediction meant that one day, good would win over bad. And I will put enmity, open hostility between you and the woman, and between your seed, offspring, and her seed. He shall fatally bruise your head, and you shall only bruise his heel. Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 The judgments on Adam, Eve, and the serpent reveal several important truths about sin and its consequences. First, sin disrupts our relationship with God and with each other. Adam and Eve's actions brought about separation from God and introduced conflict into their relationship. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, so death spread to all people, no one being able to stop it or escape its power, because they all sinned. Romans chapter 5 verse 2 Second, these judgments highlight God's justice and mercy. While he punished Adam and Eve, he also made a way for their redemption. The message about the offspring of the woman bruising the serpent's head points to Jesus Christ, who would defeat sin and death. So then, as through one trespass, Adam's sin, there resulted condemnation for all men. Even so, through one act of righteousness there resulted justification of life to all men. Romans chapter 5 verse 18 God's actions show that he is just and must punish sin, but he is also loving and merciful, providing a way for humanity to be restored to him.